Well, this morning, we are continuing in a series that we started last week called Fighting the Rut. And as, as many of you know, uh, Pastor Doug finished a series two weeks ago on revival. And last week, we talked a little bit about what's the main thing we need to be concerned about after really digging into this topic of revival and, and being challenged the way that we were challenged. And, and last week, we just said, you know, it's kind of like when you're driving your car and you get into these ruts, and sometimes it can be very, very difficult to get out of these ruts. But that's kind of what happens in life is after you do something, you experience this, you know, this, this high point where God teaches you all these things. It's like life wants to pull you back down into the normal and, and not into what you were experiencing at that revival, but back into what we consider normal. In fact, I thought it'd be good to illustrate this with a couple of videos here today. Um, this first video, unfortunately, uh, many of you have been in this situation right here where you're driving through that deep snow, and no matter which way you turn, you, uh, it's like those ruts are just kind of pulling you back in. And I'm, 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 I'm not trying to say the snow's coming that quickly, but you know what? The snow might be coming kind of quickly. And uh, in the second video, this one's kind of interesting. You know, this is a guy who is obviously doing a little bit of driving through the woods. And he's, he's got to go through this rut to kind of get down the trail that he's in. Now, he's being really careful. Did you see that? He actually just got right through that big rut. And he's doing a good job. He's being very careful, very thoughtful as to how he's driving through here. He's got to kind of go back down in the rut to get around this little tree right here. And look at that. He made it. He made it. He's out of that rut. He's out. Oh, wait. Whoa, whoa. Ooh. And he's back in that rut. Isn't it amazing? Just when you think he had made it, at the very end there, wham, he's stuck. He's right back in that rut. And so last week we were just talking about, you know, in life, especially in our culture, we have these things in life, and, and it might be something different for you than it is for me, but we have this thing that kind of dangles in front of us, and we, and we think to ourselves, man, if I could just get a little bit more of that, whatever that is for you, if I could just have a little bit more, I would be fully satisfied in life. And we start to believe that lie. And whatever it is, we understand that as soon as you get that, you realize it doesn't deliver the promises that you thought it would in making you happy and making you feel fulfilled. But what it drives us to do is to have a continual pursuit for more. And the reason we're talking about this when we talk about fighting the rut is because revival is all about God coming down. It's about our hearts wanting him more than anything else. And what we fight against, what our normal is, and what this culture tells us is this over here will make you happy. This over here is where you need to place your eyes on and your focus on, and not necessarily the God that we serve, the one true God in this world. And today I want to talk to, talk to you about something that probably impacts more than you know, probably impacts all of us here today. I know it certainly impacts me. And we're going to talk about chasing money and chasing the material stuff in this world. Last week, it was about fame. We talked about having those micro cravings for fame and that we want people to like us and, and this and that. And, and this week, we're going to talk about chasing money and things. Now, I need some help from you this morning. And I want to ask, uh, I want you to be honest with me. But how many of you would honestly say that you wouldn't mind being rich? Go ahead and raise your hand. If you, you wouldn't mind being rich, okay? I see some hands going up, a couple chuckles, possibly an amen over there, I heard. How many of you would say that you know someone who is rich? Raise your hands. You know somebody who is rich, okay? Now, I'm going to ask you a question. This is maybe, maybe a little bit more difficult. How many of you today are really, really, really rich? Like, really, really rich. Okay, well, I see a lot of hands going up. Now, are we, are we talking about, like, I could check your bank account and we could verify that? You know, now, if we were talking strictly money, I know what you all meant. But if we were talking strictly money, and because here's the thing. You know, a lot of people, you know, uh, said, hey, I'm, I'm not really rich. But 
We'd love to be really rich. In, in fact, there is this uh, funny guy I went to seminary with, and uh, he was um, he he always he was from Tennessee. He's he's a good Southern boy, and he always had something funny to comment on. And and he said, you know, money doesn't make you happy. He's like, but I'd rather be unhappy in a BMW than I would in a Honda. You know, so that was. Isn't that the way that our world thinks today, though, right? Most of us aren't rich, but we, we all raise our hand. We'd love to be really rich. And, but what, it, what happens is it starts to drive our hearts, and it starts to uh, make us continue to pursue and, and to long for and to even lust after money and more stuff. If I could just have a little bit more money, then I'd be all set, or a little bit more stuff. And, and there is this article, I, you know, you, you can do all this great research online. There is this article that asked, what would somebody do for $5 million? $5 million. What would somebody be willing to do? According to this article, 54% of people, I'm, I'm kind of glad Cindy's not in here right now, but 54% of people said they would listen to country music for the rest of their lives. Now, that doesn't actually seem too bad, right? That's kind of a bargain, you know? You can drive your brand new car just as long as you're going down the road doing your little honky-tonk inside there, right? You have your nice new car or whatever it might be. 42% of people said they would have all of their teeth removed for $5 million. All their teeth, you know? Like, hey, I'm rich, you know? I don't know. Maybe they just buy some fake ones because they have the, the means to do it. Now, this was a little shocking. 50% said that for $5 million, they would allow one random person on earth to die. In exchange for them receiving $5 million, some random person on earth would die. They would know it, and they would be okay with it. 50%. 24% of people said that they would live in solitude for the next 20 years for $5 million. It's interesting, isn't it? The pursuit to long for, to lust after. Gallup did a poll and interviewed people to ask, hey, what does it mean to be rich? Uh, basically, at what point do you cross this line in life and say, hey, you know what? I have arrived. I am now rich. And as they went through and, and uh, they polled all these people, there's a lot of varying responses. And it really depends on where somebody is at in life right now. For instance, those who made $30,000 a year, um, you know, maybe just a touch more or a touch less, uh, in that range, though, the average response was that if I made $74,000 a year, I would be rich. So a little bit more than double what they were currently making. Um, people who made roughly $50,000 a year in the U.S., they responded that it would take about $100,000 a year for them to feel rich. Then they asked some of the top income earners, you know, people well into the six figures. And those people, you know, they asked them, what would, what would it take for you to feel rich? And the average response was $5 million in assets. So the poor joker who only has, you know, $2 million in assets, he doesn't feel rich. He needs $5 million in assets to feel rich. And, and what I know about you is that you don't feel rich but you want to be rich, and so what you do is this. Like many of us, we live in the continual pursuit of more. What we have seen, though, from this poll is that when we, when we ask, like, what does it mean to be rich? That's a moving line. It's different. Maybe at some point in life, maybe you were 20 years old, and you thought, man, if I could make this much money per year, I'd, I'd be set for life. And then you get to that point in life, and you're making that much money, and then all of a sudden it doesn't feel like that much because now you're feeding a family or you have kids or you have more bills than you kind of anticipated. And you're like, well, if I could just get up here, then I'd feel like I'm all set. And you get to that point, and it, all of a sudden it's, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Money. And here's an interesting fact for you. Jesus talked more about money than he did heaven and hell combined. 11 of the 39 parables in the New Testament that he talks about are dealing with finances. Why is that? Because money is the number one contender for our heart besides God. Money. This is why Jesus talks so much about a right perspective on money. And in Luke's gospel, 
in Luke chapter 12. You'll have this on your handout, and we also have it up here on the screen for you. Here's what he said in verse 15. Then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Isn't that interesting? When Jesus said he had to say, he had to say it twice, he says, watch out, and then he says, be on guard against all kinds of greed, because life does not consist in abundance of possessions. So what he's really saying here to us is this. The quality of your life is not measured by the volume of your stuff. I've said this before. There was that bumper sticker that came out in the 90s where it said, he who dies with the most toys wins. And then there was the one that came out to kind of combat that. It said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. But culture is shouting at you from every direction. You need this. You need more of this. The dominant message that you're going to hear from the culture is that what you don't have is what you actually need if you want to be happy in life and if you want to be fulfilled. And that's why Jesus tells us you've got to be on your guard. Your life does not consist of an abundance of material possessions. And as we go on in Luke chapter 12, we see this very powerful illustration of Jesus talking to a rich guy. And we continue in verse 16. It says, and he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'm going to do. I will tear down my barns and I'm going to build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'm going to say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. So this guy, he was evidently a farmer or something like that. And he had a record year, right? He had a record year, and he asked, hey, what am I going to do? I've got all this money coming in, all these crops, and the guy says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger ones, and then I'm going to retire early. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to throw parties. And then what God said to this rich guy in verse 20, he said, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. And who's going to get all these things that you've prepared for yourself? This is how... It'll be with anyone who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now, what's fascinating about this story? Simply this. God wasn't mad at this guy for being rich. Think about this for a second. This guy was a farmer. Who made him rich? God. God made the guy rich. God allowed him. He gave him a bountiful harvest. God was disappointed, though, in this guy because he was not rich toward God. He was only rich in the things of this world. He was missing being rich with what mattered most in life. And with that in mind, I want to share with you this morning some good news and some bad news. Good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? Well, we're going to do the good news because that's how I have it written out in my, in my notes here. <clears throat> I'm going to give you some good news this morning. The good news is this. The good news is that you are rich. You are rich. Now, you may not feel rich because in here right now, it might feel like you have more bills coming in than you have money. You're rich, but you might not feel rich. But here's what I want you to understand. We we need to get some perspective in life and recognize that right now in the world, there's probably around 3 billion or so people in this world today that live off $2 or less a day. $2 or less. Some of us this morning may have spent 5 bucks on a nice coffee on our way into church. $2 or less a day. 3 billion people. It starts to put in perspective 
that based on where most people live in the world, we're actually very, very rich. In fact, you can often tell just how rich you are by the things that upset you. Like when you get really, really mad because you ordered something from Amazon and it took three days to get to your house instead of two days, right? Now, I had two days shipping. Come on, Amazon. Or you order your fast food, and as you go through the drive-thru, they forget to put, you know, your little dippy sauce in with your nuggets or something like that. And that really upsets you because somebody else prepared the food, and they didn't do it just exactly right. Or maybe you're having trouble at home with your internet, and you can't watch Netflix, and it's really upsetting to you because my internet should be working. Or if you got those, you know, nice new AirPods to go with your phone, and, and for some reason your AirPods didn't charge, or you forgot them and left them at home, and so when you talk on the phone, you actually have to lift it up to your head just to talk on the phone. You can often tell how rich you are just by what bothers you. When I get hungry, when you get hungry, you know, if, if you can hop in your car, drive your car to go get something to eat, that already puts you in the top 15% of the wealthiest people in the world. I know it doesn't always feel that way. If you can drive your car past 14 or, or maybe even 22 other restaurants to go to your preferred restaurant to have somebody else, you know, who milks the cow or catches the fish or prepares the chicken, cooks your food, cleans everything, prepares your plate, delivers it to you, puts a little garnish on it, and then you complain because, hey, man, that like took seven minutes, you know, and that's a long time. That's how rich most of us truly are. The good news is that you're really rich. And I understand, in a room full of people, there are people that are facing difficult financial situations. Medical bills pile up, or a divorce happens, or a single parent that's fighting to stay alive. And so I don't want to diminish, I don't want to diminish the reality of that world here today. But overall, when we look at this country and we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we're doing pretty okay. We're pretty rich. And if we're going to acknowledge before God that he's actually blessed us, that compared to the most of the people in this world, we truly are rich, then, then we need to be rich in a way that honors God. And in order to be good at something, the first thing you have to do is acknowledge it. So this morning, I, I want you to all... Just really acknowledge this with me this morning, if you believe it. Uh, and, and we're just going to say out loud, I want you to say, I'm rich. Go ahead, are you guys ready? I'm rich. I'm rich. You are rich. God has blessed us. Now, if for a moment you feel a little bit uncomfortable saying that, I want you to ask yourself why. You know, why do you feel uncomfortable? Why do you think you might feel a little bit embarrassed or a little or maybe even a little bit apologetic saying I'm rich here's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 519 <clears throat> Solomon says this moreover when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil this is a gift from God understand what he just said there when God gives someone wealth who gives it God our God gives wealth too, too often today we have people that say hey I'm a self-made man I went out and I did this and I did this no actually God made you the one who is able to do that you have gifts you have talents and you have opportunities you were born in a place where we have more opportunities uh, than most nations in the world God is the one who's behind that. When God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, they, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, what is this? It's a gift from God. That's what Scripture tells us. So if, if for a moment, if you feel kind of embarrassed or apologetic or ashamed, you have to ask yourself, in what other, what other area of life are you blessed by God, but you're embarrassed by that blessing? Think about it. If somebody comes up to me and says, hey, it just seems like you and Cindy have a really great marriage. How should I respond? Should I be like, oh, no, no, I'm so sorry that you think that. No, 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 no. Please understand that's not the case. You know, would I be apologetic about that? 
Or if somebody came up and said, hey, God's really blessed you with good health, would you be like, no, 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 I'm sorry. You, you got it all wrong. I, I, I'm so embarrassed that you actually just said that. Or how about a full head of hair? Pastor Doug's not here today. <clears throat> we don't apologize for other areas of blessing. But in this one area, for some reason, people feel very insecure. If, if you're to come up and say, hey, God's really blessed you. You're really rich. And today, we see that God has blessed us that way. In this nation. We don't really see it, but he has. God has blessed me. That's the good news. The good news is that you're rich. Now I want to get to the bad news. The bad news is that you're rich. The bad news, and, and this really is bad news, because being rich puts you and me at a tremendous spiritual disadvantage. In fact, Jesus had this meaningful conversation with a rich, uh, powerful young guy. And his stuff and his money was so important to him that it hindered him. It actually kept him from becoming a disciple of Jesus. And you see this in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around at his disciples. How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his word. But Jesus said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And here's, you can underline this one on your, on your handout. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So the good news is that you're rich and you're blessed. The bad news is you're rich. It's a tremendous spiritual disadvantage. Why? Because we already have a roof over our heads. You've probably got food in your pantry at home. You can buy pretty much whatever you need. Or many of us, whatever you want. You've, you've probably never in, in recent years had the privilege of, of having to uh, pray, like really, really pray out to God. Hey, God, today provide my daily bread because I have nothing. Because most of us have a closet full of food. And we've missed out on seeing God provide for us. It's also a disadvantage because we get so distracted. We've got rich people options. You know, if you go on social media, it's called like first world problems. You know, it's like, oh, my, my phone crashed again. That's a first world problem. Sometimes we're so rich and blessed with opportunities that it causes us to be overwhelmed and exhausted and tired, often missing out on the things that matter most in life. And if you don't believe me, take a trip to a nation that's a very poor developing nation. The first day you show up, and, and maybe some of you experienced this with us in Guyana, and they're not like the poorest nation, but you show up, and, and you start to see this extreme poverty. You see the conditions that people live in, and you, you don't even believe it. You kind of feel sorry for these people, and you feel compassion. But by the day three or four rolls around, what you find is that you, you realize that these people have something that you don't have. They've actually got time with other people, and they build these relationships. And they often have an incredible intimacy with God. And what they don't have is they don't have stress and anxiety and, and the burden of managing stuff. And on day five or so, you find a small part of yourself jealous of that simplicity that is in their lives. They have this simplicity. They have, they have intimacy with other people and, and they always have time to do whatever they want with other people and they have this love for one another and appreciation of their community and, and they have an, a deep and an intense adoration for God. And it's a disadvantage sometimes that we have so much. 
Another reason it's a disadvantage is this, because Scripture tells us to whom much is given, much is required. In other words, it's great that you're rich because you can truly enjoy what God has given you, and that honors God. But God also expects more because we're rich. We truly have a greater responsibility. And all the time that we're rich, every moment of every day, culture shouts at us, hey, hey, what those things that you don't have in life, like that better TV or that brand new purse or the shoes or the sunglasses or the, the right wallet or the, the, the remodeled bathroom, whatever it might be. All that stuff that you don't have, that's what you need to be happy in life. And that's why Jesus said, be on your guard. Why? Because a person's life, what really matters doesn't consist in the abundance of money and stuff. The problem is, I think we know that. I think that deep down, I think that we know that. But the problem is that our lifestyles often do not reflect that truth. Our lifestyles often do not reflect that truth. And if you're really, really honest, I think that we can all admit that we've bought into the lie that the more stuff out there, you know, these things that we chase, we think those really matter. And, and then we think, if, if I can just get that, I'm finally going to be happy. That's what culture really pushes on us. Whenever we believe that our problems can be solved by more stuff and more money, then we are under the curse of money. See, more money isn't going to help kids stay off drugs. More money isn't going to um, help somebody who's sick to be healed of cancer. More money isn't going to make depression go away. More money isn't going to save a marriage. What we don't need is more of what's temporary in this world. What we do need is more of what is eternal. We don't need more money. What we do need is more of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be under the power of something in this world. I want to be under the, the power and living in the blessings of the eternal world and a life that truly honors God. And here's what Paul tells Timothy. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 17. He said, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. See, that tells me right there that our God richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, don't feel guilty when we look at this nation and we see that we're rich. Don't feel guilty about that. God gives it to you. God blesses. He's a good God. He loves to bless his children. He freely blesses his children. And when you're faithful with a little, God says that he will give you a little bit more. Some of you have been faithful in your life. You've taken the things that God has given you and you've been a steward of it and you've maximized it and God has multiplied it out for his kingdom. And that's a blessing. Don't feel guilty, but do feel responsible. God has blessed you, but it's not all for you. You have every right to enjoy it, but it's not all for you. Because he says to whom much is given, and that's many of us here today, much is actually expected. And that's why God's word to us rich people is this. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in what? To be rich in good deeds. And he says that rich people better be generous and be willing to share. And then he says to lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Why? So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Be generous. Be willing to share. Many of you know Pastor Andy Stanley. And a number of years ago, he said this in one of his messages. And uh, I, I think it'd be a good exercise for us to all say this here today. So I just want you to repeat after me. God has blessed me with more than I need. I'm rich. But I will not trust in my riches. 
but in him who richly provides. Because I have more, I will give more and do more. I thought that was pretty interesting. Because I don't often think that we realize that we truly are rich. Is there somebody who has more money than you? Absolutely. Well, at least I'm assuming so. Is there somebody who has less money than you? Absolutely. And too often, we don't even turn our eyes to those who truly need it. We're rich and blessed. And that's the bad news because it can be distracting. It can be a spiritual disadvantage. And we also realize more is expected of us. And I don't know about you, but with everything in me, this is what I want to live. I want to say that my God has blessed me with more than I need, but I will not trust in stuff, but in the one who richly provides. And because he has given me more with everything in me, I am called, equipped, empowered, and honored to give more and to do more. The temporary things of this world, they promise, but they certainly don't deliver. We need to do something that matters. We need to do something that lasts. And my challenge is let's make a difference. Like only rich people can make a difference. Let's take what's been given to us and let's use it as a blessing for other people. Maybe you know somebody who needs help. You know, somebody who might even need a, a financial a little hand, you know, hand up or a, or a, a pick me up. Maybe you could spend an afternoon, grab some boxes and spend an afternoon or a day helping somebody move. Or maybe you could even serve and, and give your time like so many of you did this weekend when we had the uh, fall festival. Maybe one day you'd like to save up some of your own money and use some of your own vacation time and go on a mission trip, devoting that whole week to God instead of ourself. When we were on a trip a, a couple years ago, uh, down to Guyana. I think it was the first year that Rod and Ben and some of you guys went with us. Um, towards the end of the week, we had dinner at one of the families, uh, one of the pastor's families, uh, Pastor Steve and Joy. And we went there and we ate and we had a wonderful time. And uh, we got back to Pastor Andy's house and, and Kathleen was talking to us and she said, I can't believe what they did. The food that they served us probably took them a long time to save up the money for in order to prepare it for us. And we didn't even know at the time. But she told us, like, the food that they served is not common and it cost them a great deal, but they wanted to do it for you guys. And when something like that happens, somebody wants to bless you that you know has considerably less than you do, it's a very humbling experience. See, today, what, what I can tell you this, culture's never going to stop. It's going to continue to tell you that the things that you don't have in life, those are the things you truly need to be happy. That's not going to stop in our lifetime. But Jesus says, watch out. Because your life doesn't consist in the abundance of stuff. And I don't know about you, but I can definitely say that God has blessed us. He's blessed me. We're rich because of God's blessing on this nation. And my God has blessed me with more than I need, but I will not trust in those riches. I will trust in him who richly provides. And because we have more, church, we need to be doing more and giving more and serving more. And in that way, we will find life more abundantly than we could have ever thought for ourselves, which is the whole meaning behind this. Love God and love people. When we do those two things first, I truly believe that God will give us a love for life that we could have never thought for ourselves. God wants us to be rich in a way that honors him. I'm tired of settling for the lower things of this world. What we need to pursue is the higher things that God has called us to, things that matter for eternity. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we recognize today, Lord, that you have truly put your hand of blessing upon this nation. Often, Father, we don't think that way. We look around at ourselves and we don't think that about ourselves because we're kind of looking to get to that next bracket of, of what we feel is going to make us happier. And instead, Lord, what your word says is that everything that you've given to us, Lord, 
Uh, you've done it so that we can turn around and we can bring you honor and glory in the way that we give, Lord, in the way that we help, in the way that you have called us to be rich to good deeds, Father. I pray that you would turn our eyes to the things, Lord, that are not temporary, but the things, Lord, that last for eternity. I thank you, Lord, for your hand of blessing, but, Lord, let us use it to bring you glory and not, Lord, fall back into those ruts so easily of those things that we feel are going to make us happy, but they truly aren't. Uh, Father, just place our eyes on the things, Lord, of, that matter. The things, Lord, of your word, of your kingdom, not of this world. And let us use it, Lord, to spread the light and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.